Hey everyone, welcome to Martaloop Church. Today, we're beginning a new series of messages on the opening words of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, words commonly called the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are basically blessings spoken by the Son of God, Jesus, to people that he loves. One theologian, uh, Bruner, called them the most significant words ever spoken, spoken by Jesus to you in order to bless your life. In the Bible, to be blessed is to hear God say to you uh, through Jesus or by the Spirit, I see you, I'm with you, and I am on your side. So to be blessed by God is to receive a word that changes you, that so names a reality that that reality actually begins and then comes fully into being. And of course, to receive a blessing from God is to know uh, that God is near enough to confer that blessing on you. Now, can you imagine God literally being near enough to you for that to happen? God, God blessing you. Um, it makes me think it might be like what one of those scenes where you see a devout Catholic trembling before the Pope who reaches out and touches their head, um, feeling, you know, someone like the Pope is, is blessing me. Or maybe closer to home, uh, if you've seen and participated in infant baptisms, um, <clears throat> maybe it's like that, uh, that thing that uh, many of us have seen in churches, receiving the riches of something incomprehensible that you as an infant know absolutely nothing about. And I'm thinking about that baptism moment um, and how it must be a pretty amazing thing for God if you could dare imagine that. Um, and I do, because for me, it's the most amazing part of my job. Um, those words of blessing, doing the baptism, of course, but then those words of blessing afterward, when I put my hand on the infant's head and always uh, have these spontaneous blessings that come out, and it feels like in those moments I'm speaking God's love over and for this child. It's so, and when, when it's happening, it's as though something really is uh, playing out, being conferred upon or given to that child through the blessing of water and words. <clears throat> and for me, those moments are filled with meaning and joy, which then makes me wonder if God feels the same kind of joy when God blesses us. So the Beatitudes are Jesus' joyful blessing words to you. Listen to what he says to you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, doing the right thing, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so over these next few weeks, and we'll see how we space it out over the summer, um, we, I, we, are going to unpack each of these Beatitudes and hopefully do three things. First, try to define what it really means to be these things, to be poor in spirit or meek or pure in heart or a peacemaker. 
And then second, um, try to understand how those ways of being, those dispositions, can be places where we can know and experience God more. And then third, and this is new uh, for our church, um, we're going to take up a spiritual practice that will hopefully help us be more poor in spirit, be more meek, be more pure in heart, etc. And that spiritual exercise or practice is going to be a literal practical take-home exercise written out over two or three pages um, designed to take you through a series of questions and some readings to help you grow, um, you know, for this week, being poor in spirit, um, in your heart and grow your faith. So it's going to be a hands-on practical tool that you can take up for yourself and personally apply in your life to help lead you into a new way of being faith-wise in your relationship with God. And we're all going to do that, hopefully. Um, I'm going to do that uh, so that we can better know God, receive God's kingdom, know the kingdom of heaven presence that we're uh, living our lives within, uh, be comforted, be filled, etc., etc., see God more. <clears throat> okay, now, when I read the Beatitudes, um, you read that list, and you've probably already made this connection, maybe long before now, um, but it's hard not to connect um, what they describe in terms of uh, what a person who is blessed is like in these places. It's hard not to connect those realities to the person of Christ. Um, Jesus, of course, knew God perfectly in all things, and he knew that God could be known via all of the dispositions described in these Beatitudes. And he'd actually himself, I'm sure, experienced God in those um, seemingly, uh, you know, not always the best of best, and yet still God-present places. Um, and being the kind of person that these Beatitudes describe, um, and that person who could know God and knew God perfectly in those kinds of places, um, Jesus knew what he was doing when he read these most profound words ever spoken. Um, he's saying to you and to me and to us, uh, there is blessing in these kinds of places. And I've been there. Trust me. Uh, there is a knowing of God even there. And I will be with you in these places. Trust me. So, over these next few weeks, we are going to step into the blessed places where Jesus knew and experienced God, as expressed through each of these Beatitudes. We're going to know him through these uh, ways of being, these dispositions before God, these stances before the face of God. And through Christ, we're going to hopefully know God his Father, God the Father, more. And in my mind, this is a very timely moment to be doing this. Um, as we begin to step out of this pandemic, which has humbled us in so many ways, right, and restricted us and, and has worked us uh, into places we never imagined being, psychologically, spiritually, and otherwise, um, worn us down so that we're ready for the new, um, I don't want to waste this moment, um, and I don't want to forget what God has done in me, in us, um, and go back to what was formerly normal. Um, I, I want to step into a new normal. I, I want to know you, Lord, more. So can you imagine that, that decision leading to that reality, defining the rest of your life? So before we get into it some more, um, let's start with a prayer, and then we'll unpack this first beatitude. <clears throat> Lord, I'm thinking anyone who's going to church and listening to this uh, message and tracking uh, with this faith community um, is, is going to say, yes, I, I do want 
my life to move on to a new path, a slightly different direction, one that is more accurately and precisely pointed toward you, knowing you, loving you, serving you, living out <clears throat> my life, experiencing the presence of God. And so, if that is what we are uh, wanting, Lord, we pray that you would meet us um, on that road, on that path, um, walk with us uh, knowingly, maybe sometimes unknowingly, in terms of what you would teach us through these Beatitudes. And uh, yeah, somehow through the reading and the meditating and the spiritual practicing of these things, um, your spirit would be about making a change in us and making us more like you and more with you with us in this world. So do that work, we pray, Lord, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, Beatitude number one. Blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, I think in its most basic form, it's about genuinely needing God. Blessed are those who really need God, for they will find him. And in a slightly expanded form, it might look like this. Blessed are you when you are completely dependent, marginalized, have hit bottom, failed and have fallen short, are desperate, have no other options, and are helpless without God's help. For God is there, and you are not alone. Because God wants to help you. This is God's heart for you, for all of humanity, all that he's made. I live in the high and holy places, God says, but also with the low-spirited, the spirit-crushed, and what I do is put new spirit in them, get them up and on their feet again. This is what God is like. Blessed, therefore, are the poor in spirit. So, how are you doing on the poor in spirit continuum in your life? As you begin to step out, of this time of huge restriction and difficulty and stress and chronic strain, this pandemic that's ex exposed so many of your vulnerabilities and ours as a culture, as a society, and has restricted and limited and, and in so doing reshaped you, how are you doing when it comes to living a poor in spirit life? In the Gospel of Luke, um, the Gospels often record Jesus' stories, not all of them all the same stories, but a lot of the important ones, but they're told with a different voice. So in the Gospel of Luke, compared to Matthew, which I just read from, Luke records this first beatitude with slightly different words. He writes, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Not blessed are the poor in spirit, but blessed are the poor stop. Um, no, don't stop. Listen, uh, but stop at that point. He doesn't have anything uh, describing uh, what kind of poverty there. So Luke, uh, in doing that, is not trying to, you know, glorify poverty, because poverty sucks and it's wrong, and social justice is what his book, his gospel, is all about. But his framing of this first beatitude is helpful when it comes to understanding what it means to be poor in spirit. To a large degree, poverty happens to people, right? Um, life plays out and it leaves you poor. You're born into a poor family or you're trapped in some kind of systemic uh, poverty cycle. And so in many ways, being poor in spirit is the same, and we talk about this often in this church, right? To be poor in spirit is to be in a place um, you've been um, unwillingly, at least initially, um, not willingly stepping into, unwillingly put into. And there's something about 
the total loss of control when we experience being put unwillingly into those places that leaves us in a place that opens us up to receiving in a new and different way help. It's, it's like in those places we're more available to God. It's as though we're closer to giving up control because we've lost so much of it already. There isn't much left. Our, our desperation evokes a more honest and real need for God. We are genuinely more open to being saved in those poor, poor in spirit places. And you've been there, right? <laughs> uh, when you've had nowhere else to go and some tragedy has hit your life and you've prayed at that moment, if you think back to it, more real prayers than you've ever prayed in your life, more desperate prayers. Your child is born with a disability. Uh, your partner has left you for another. Uh, financial calamity has hit your life. You're told it's, it's cancer. And Jesus is saying, not to glorify any of the wrongness of those things, but he is saying, when you were in that place, in that poor in spirit place, it, it's good, You're, you were blessed. Because God was with you. In his book, The Jesus I Never Knew, um, great book, old book that I read two decades ago now, I guess, <clears throat> Philip Yancey cites a writer named Monica Helwig who came up with a list of, quote, uh, advantages that the poor have when it comes to living a poor in spirit kind of life. And again, not to glorify poverty, it's wrong. But there's something about being in a place of poverty that actually, if you name it, um, can put you in a better place in terms of being a poor in spirit before God kind of person. And so Phil Yancey took Helwig's list and kind of inserted himself into it as a kind of self-check on his own poverty of spirit. And he wrote a list of signs that what he identifies as uh, what are the signs that I am poor in spirit, which I am now going to read to you in a painfully slow way. So these are the signs that you are a poor in spirit kind of person. Number one, I know that I am in urgent need of help. I know how to depend on other people who are poor, just like me. I know how to put my security in people and not in things. I have no exaggerated sense of self-importance, no exaggerated need for privacy. I expect little from competition and much more from cooperation with others. I can distinguish between necessities and luxuries. I can wait because I have acquired a kind of dogged patience born of acknowledged dependence. My fears are realistic and never exaggerated because I know that one can survive great suffering and want. When I hear the good news about God preached to me, it sounds like good news and not like a threat or scolding. And lastly, I can respond to the call of God with abandonment and uncomplicated totality because I have so little to lose and I'm ready for anything. This past weekend, Fran and I watched a movie on Disney Plus called Nomadland. Um, director Chloe Zhao just won the Academy Award for Best Director on this film. 
And um, watching this film, Heads Up, is going to be an integral part of the spiritual practice that I'm going to send to all of you, or that already went to you via the email that sent you the link to this message. Um, but the story of Nomadland is filled with people who embody and exemplify living a poor-in-spirit life. Uh, you watch that film, and you swear you're seeing Jesus are people made in the image of Jesus everywhere in the deep humility of such real and authentic people as they live out their lives as nomads through the way they so freely and unthinkingly share with each other in the best sense of unthinkingly and are wholly available to attend to and listen to one another and how each of them knows their need, honestly knows their need for other people and the community that they're a part of. I mean, you look at that whole story and afterwards, I, it, it's what you wish community in our world was like everywhere, what church community was, is like. I don't think I've ever been in a church that is as, as real and beautiful and true and communally as what this film depicts. It's what humanity in all places should be like. And taking in all of those lives of all of those poor in spirit people, you could see the blessing of that in their lives. That living in and out of that place was a God-blessed place. The kingdom of heaven was, was breaking out everywhere. And so blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, that sphere within which the will of God is reality. And what I do, God says, is put new spirit in them and get them up and on their feet again. What they can't do, what you can't do, God says, I can. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And there's a beautiful scene as I read that <laughs> of Francis McDormand, the main protagonist in Nomadland, being cleansed uh, and, and, and at a pivotal moment, a turning moment in her life um, where she uh, is really at that point letting go of the last vestiges of control and trying to uber control their life. It's exhausting. Who really wants to live that kind of life for the rest of their life? Where she accepts uh, and begins to accept more deeply her lot in life and, and lets other people, cons you know, not so surprisingly, into, begins to let other people into her life uh, and becomes a human being in community for the first time again. <clears throat> where where you see all of that happen and you think, this is what you are calling us to, Jesus. You want us, you want me to let other people in more, to let you in more, to let others in more. Take my yoke upon you, Jesus says, and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The film Nomadland is the fictional embodiment of that invitation. And through Jesus, the Bible teaches clearly, the kingdom of heaven is yours. Because Jesus knew he was in urgent need of help. He went to the Father for everything. I can't say anything apart from what my Father tells me to say. He knew how to depend on other people who were poor, just as him, born to a peasant girl in a backwater Galilean vi village. 
He knew how to put his security in people and not things. He had nothing, no place to rest his head. Other people supported him. He had so few possessions. And he had no exaggerated sense of self-importance or exaggerated need for privacy. Healthy privacy, yes. Going away to pray all night, yes. Spending time with God, his Father. But I mean, the overall trajectory of Christ was to make himself available and in fact make himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant for the sake of others. And Jesus expected little from competition, expected much more from cooperation with others like his disciples, who he laid his life down for. Etc., etc. You could go through Yancey's whole list and, and see Christ embodying all of those things, living all of those things. For you, <laughs> doing all of that for us, for me, for us. And so I guess the question for us is, for you is, do you want to accept his invitation to enter into that blessed place of being poor in spirit like he was? Do you want to know God more like how he knows God more? Because he's the way, he's the door, he's the path into that heavenly place. The, the, the spiritually self-sufficient, they'll never get there. They can't see the path. They can't find their way on it. Only the humble, spiritual, poor can find him there. And, yeah, no surprise, in order for that to happen, you need to let go, I need to let go, we need to let go of everything. And we need to continually, I'm learning in this life, let go again and again and more and more and in deeper and deeper ways, everything. J Jesus knew that a fully flourishing life, as, as God intended, could only be lived out in a wholehearted, God-dependent, poor-in-spirit way. And so he says, Blessed are you when you're in that place. If life forced you there, okay, I'm there. But if you want to choose to go there, I'll be there too. Every moment of every day, just giving it all up for God, giving it all away with every fiber of your being, being poor in spirit. And again, Jesus surely knows the joy and the freedom and the fullness of living a human life in that place. The indescribable peace of being poor in spirit before the all-powerful God, uh, our Father, um, living in that incredible strength, place of strength and power, and knows, he knew, he knows, and we can know the beauty and hope of that place. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, heaven on earth for you and I, if we can find ourselves in that place and stay in that place and live out our faith from that place. And so, as I said at the beginning, um, Included with your email, if you're tracking on our email list as a church, is a spiritual practice um, that I wrote up this week. Um, and I'm going to write one for each of the eight Beatitudes in the weeks ahead. This one's a little bit long. Hopefully they'll be a little bit shorter, um, but just as deep and meaningful going forward. Um, but it's, it, this is a practical exercise in reading that is designed to help you grow into a more poor-in-spirit disposition. Um, 
And if you are hearing this and you can't get a link to that or can't find that, it'll be on my blog at the church website, uh, martaloopchurch.ca, um, or you can contact the office. We can get you on the email list because we're going to keep sending these things out uh, for this Beatitude series, but also going forward as a church as we're really going to try to help people um, take a hold of their own faith and, and learn practices that leave them in a better place in terms of ex engaging God everywhere. Um, so you can contact our office if you want to get on that email list. And then lastly, if you choose to join us on this spiritual journey, um, as you do it, and if some cool things happen and you feel comfortable, send me a note um, uh, about, tell me this, a story uh, if, you, if, if you'd like. Um, because I think this whole spiritual growth thing, it isn't just you on your own, it isn't me on my own, it's all of us together um, shaping one another and hearing one another's story and collectively as a community becoming a poor in spirit kind of community. And then lastly, lastly, um, we're scheduling a Zoom call, just another community gathering for June 22nd at 7 p.m. I'll keep announcing that over the next few weeks. Um, but if you don't, you know, if you have a story to share then or you just want to hear how this has been playing out in other people's lives or you have questions about what we're uh, throwing into your life to engage, um, we'll have a converse, maybe a 90-minute conversation around all of those things. Um, on that night, on that date. So, okay, a whole bunch of practical stuff to end the sermon. Normally don't end that way, but um, always end with a prayer. So let me close with a prayer, and then, uh, yeah, um, we'll pray that, that God um, uses what you've heard um, over this last half hour and what you'll read um, sometime in the days ahead. To, to really change you and um, by his spirit take you into a, a new and beautiful and alive faith-filled place. So that would be a good thing to pray about. And, and we're not praying for something, Lord, that you don't want. A transformed life more inclined toward you uh, a newly enfleshed heart where the calcified hardness of what was formerly us has now been replaced, has fallen away so that we can love you in the way we're made to love you and glorify you with our lives and honor you with our witness and who we are in the world. Surely you would be delighted that we would want to try to step toward you in these ways. So as we do that, each of us and all of us as a little Martelloop church, meet us on the path. Help us to hear your voice calling from up ahead. Whisper things by your spirit in us that uh, show us things we've never really known about ourselves, the good, the bad, and the ugly so that we could then, in the knowing and the naming, be freed uh, into that new, um, poor in spirit like you, dependent, trusting, vulnerable, open, faithful, empowered place. And shape us into a community that then becomes all of those things for others, all of our neighbors, our families, our friends, your city, Calgary, um, so many souls, uh, people um, looking uh, for answers, asking existential questions, trying to find their way. Help us to be a church that is uh, humbly poor in spirit in a way that is attractive and translucent and a pointer to you we pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And we've sought the truth when we felt the pain even wander beyond our 
won't you pray with me to close today? God, God, help us to become poor in spirit. God, help us to surrender and relinquish those things, those parts of our life, those parts of our estate, our bank account, whatever it is, our pride, our ego. God, help us to hand those over to you. Help us to give them up and let those things go. God, take our ill-conceived notions of ourselves and of you and help us see better. God, give us vision and give us eyes to see you as you would have us see you and eyes to see each other as you would have us see each other. God, and eyes to see ourselves as you would have us see ourselves. God, help us to become poor in spirit so that we can become greater in our love for you. Amen. Have a great week. See you next time.